Hi, folks. Welcome, and thanks for coming. Um, in the last few days, we've had seen one of the most catastrophic outcomes for our communities experiencing homelessness. And we are here today, and we have come together um, because there we have to find a way to correct course. And so to kick us off, I am going to introduce you to Mayor Mulvaney Stanick from Burlington. Thank you, Brenda, and good morning. It's been a minute since I struggled with this thing. Hold on. There we go. All right. Good morning. Uh, I am Mayor Emma Mulvaney Stanick, the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. We are gathered here today to call for an immediate life-saving life -saving action for vulnerable Vermonters. No one denies the reality that Vermont faces a worsening housing crisis, one where the long-term solution is to build thousands of new housing units of all kinds in all places. Unfortunately, new housing production will take years to catch up in order to meet the need. And while we continue to debate policy solutions, that will increase our housing supply, we are facing a humanitarian crisis. Thousands of Vermonters, including hundreds of children, and I need to emphasize that as a mother, hundreds of children, seniors, folks with disabilities, and many with complex health needs are falling through the cracks. Our shelter system is at capacity with already long wait lists. Our service providers have continuously adapted in an effort to serve more people. In Burlington and everywhere, um, city employees and town employees have no formal background in social work or human services, yet have found themselves on the front line of this crisis. Our service providers, our shelter operators, and municipalities do not have the staff or financial resources to bridge the gap created by this mass unsheltering. In Burlington, we allocated $50,000 in our fiscal year 25 budget to provide portable toilets and dumpsters for folks who have no option but to camp. This allocation does not reflect the staff time dedicated to outreach or the expenses associated with remediation of abandoned sites. And I'll just pause to say that you know, moving these kind of resources is, is, is immediately inadequate and it is not a solution. Um, in Burlington, it's not a solution anywhere. Uh, and yet this was, uh, when I became mayor, this was, this was the only right thing to do because we were already in a humanitarian crisis when I became mayor in April and it's only gotten worse. I know Burlington is not alone in facing post-pandemic budget challenges. This ongoing mass unsheltering will place additional strain on municipalities and nonprofit budgets, as well as staff who are already facing burnout. Between September 15th and October 8th, more vulnerable Vermonters, including 87 children in Chittenden County, will lose their stability they have had through the motel program. As the days become shorter and the nights grow longer and colder, children, many younger than five years old, will be sleeping outside as will seniors and people with disabilities, some who require oxygen and other life-sustaining supports that require basic electricity. This is a policy failure that requires immediate action. This is a policy failure that requires immediate action. The city of Burlington worked quickly to identify 12 campsites that were made available for families exiting motels. And together with the Burlington School District and Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, we put out the call for donations of tents and other essentials to help folks meet their basic needs in this crisis. But I want to be absolutely clear, camping is not a solution. Scrambling to provide tents and firewood is not a solution. We need to discuss and debate alternatives to the GA program. That conversation is necessary and important. That conversation must center the most vulnerable Vermonters and their needs. Recent conversations have failed to include a just, just transition, and which has led us today to this current emergency. Cities and towns, service providers, and shelter operators need the state to step up now. Now is the time for leadership from the governor. Governor Scott, please heed the growing calls for action to support vulnerable Vermonters. Exercise your executive authority to rapidly create more shelter capacity by immediately declaring an emergency, a state of emergency, and directing your AHS to create safe, accessible, safe, non-congregate emergency shelter in every region of the state. Call a special session of the Vermont legislature to remove the cap on the motel rooms and the number of nights available to eligible participants. As the mayor of Vermont's largest city and a mom of two small children, 
I refuse to allow this to be our new normal. Vermonters are better than this. Governor Scott, I repeat, this is the time for leadership. We have stood up before when other emergencies happen in our state and include floods or storms or whatever they might be, and we show up for each other. We don't walk away. This should be no different. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Bond. I'm the executive director of Good Samaritan Haven, which is the shelter network for the unhoused in Washington County in central Vermont. Good Sam maintains four shelters. Our street outreach team supports those who are on the streets or camping, and we also support people who have been living in the area, local area motels over the last four years. Before the elements embodied in Act 113 went into effect on September 15th and September 19th, Good Sam was already at our bed capacity, and we were regularly being asked to expand our shelter bed capacity. In order to fully address the shelter needs of the unhoused or precariously housed in this region, we'd have to increase our bed capacity by almost 200%, adding around 160 more shelter beds. The motel system is the current safety net that addresses the state's balance of needed emergency shelter beds. And by imposing a 10-week window of time between September 15th and December 1st, where individuals must leave the motels before trying to get back in on December 1st, a deep crisis has emerged for the ultra-vulnerable in our state. There's nowhere for this volume of people to go. These are people who have exceedingly complex medical, physical, mental health, developmental condi conditions or experiences, and have a very high chance of perishing if they have to camp one single night outdoors. The anxiety, depression, despair, and anguish that this is causing individuals and families is unconscionable. To make people feel unwanted and shunned is an act of social neglect. The way this legislation is structured has placed undue and unethical levels of burden on the homelessness service providers of the state as well. We do not have the resources, the capacity, the ability within the structure of Act 113 to affect any meaningful service, support, or improvement of the situation. My colleagues and I are experiencing moral injury from being faced with the inability to help people in the motels and being forced to watch this kind of suffering of our fellow community members. Service providers cannot be expected to shoulder this impossible burden. And yet, we are the ones, especially in Washington County, handing out tents, sleeping bags to people who have never camped before. We're the ones with vans or our own cars transporting people to the next temporary solution. We're the ones trying to keep people from dying outside. This life safety issue must be addressed immediately. Remember that if one of us is hurting, all of us are hurting. And this crisis creates a ripple effect across our society. Yet shelter solutions cannot be put up overnight, and it takes time, and it must be done with conscious and trauma-informed planning, not knee-jerk reaction. The only way to do this is to remove the two 10-week periods where people must leave motels. This will give the state and our network of service providers time to create the shelter and housing capacity that is needed for Vermont. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Falco Schilling, and I'm the Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. We are here today because the unsheltering of vulnerable people has created a crisis in our communities. We need to take action to address the impacts of the arbitrary and harmful caps on access to, the emergency, to emergency shelter through the General Assistance Program. In a state that prides itself on compassion and mutual support, everyone should have a safe place to live. The people of Vermont broadly agree that we need humane, long-term solutions to the state's housing crisis and continued funding for emergency housing in the meantime. 
eliminating housing for hundreds of people, all whom have already been determined to be vulnerable, during a historic housing crisis puts countless Vermonters at risk of imminent harm. Far from saving the state money, this plan simply passes financial and legal, legal liability on our cities and towns and will cost taxpayers more in the long run than it would to fund humane solutions now. This is why last week the ACLU of Vermont published an open letter to all municipalities outlining their responsibilities to protect the rights of unhoused people and at the same time offering our support for municipalities urging state leaders to address the problem that they created. This ma mass unsheltering is deeply troubling to the ACLU of Vermont on several fronts. Not only because it's a denial of the basic humanity and dignity of our unhoused neighbors, but also because we are an organization that advocates for evidence-based solutions to the root causes of harm in our communities, including homelessness and mass incarceration. Investments in short and long-term solutions to homelessness are critical at preserving the health and safety of our communities and not criminalizing people who simply have nowhere else to go. We know that people who are unhoused are far more likely to become victims of crime. We know that people who are unhoused disproportionately suffer from substance use disorder, mental health conditions, and other disabilities that require treatment and support, not handcuffs. Over this last year, we've watched with growing alarm as we've seen thousands of Vermonters become unsheltered and pushed onto the streets. It's no surprise after state leaders exited hundreds of people from their housing that communities have expressed concern about the condition of our towns and cities. Seeing so many of our neighbors living in crisis should absolutely concern us all. But stigmatizing and criminalizing is not the solution. We need to act now by implementing housing first policies and principles at all levels of a response to the homelessness crisis. Closing off available beds and forcing people onto the street is a policy choice, not an inevitability. These policies directly harm vulnerable Vermonters who rely on the emergency housing program as a means to shelter. And it betrays our shared values of compassionate, responsive government and strong, supportive communities. Sadly, these remarks are nearly identical to the remarks I gave in this very same room four months ago, when many of the same people standing here today came together to warn policymakers of the disastrous impact of imposing arbitrary and inhumane caps on access to emergency housing. These, insult, these results were entirely predictable. We need to stop closing our eyes to the real and devastating impacts that come from it not addressing the needs of the most vulnerable in our communities. That is why we're calling on the legislature and the administration to fund and implement short-term investments in emergency housing programs without caps and without unnecessary barriers as well as commit to long-term solutions to expand the availability of high-quality, affordable housing for everyone in the state. Thank you. Before I begin, I just want to say that uh, State's Attorney Donnelly has COVID and wanted to join us, but she is available for questions about this issue. I'm Brenda Siegel, the Executive Director of End Homelessness Vermont. What began on Thursday, September 19th in Vermont to people experiencing homelessness is nowhere close to a humane treatment of our neighbors. I saw babies and school children being sent to live in the woods and on our streets. On Thursday, I saw people on oxygen and in wheelchairs completely disregarded by our state. I saw people who are extremely vulnerable with psychiatric disabilities left to fend for themselves. I saw people who lost their homes in the floods dropped. That we allowed and even orchestrated this humanitarian crisis in this state is inexcusable. This Saturday, this coming Saturday, because these exits are happening in waves, we have a client that is completely bedridden, whom I have no idea what to do with. I have asked, no, I have begged. I have begged for help from the state. I have asked what I'm supposed to do.
Do I Hoya lift him to the sidewalk for him to have a catastrophic outcome? I do not know what to do. I simply can't resolve that problem or even move him from his hotel room. And while potentially this may be the most terrible case I have dealt with, it is not the only horrifying one that we will face on Saturday. I have a client with almost no mobility who can only move his arms, who needs a caregiver to support for showering and bathroom, and only has very limited movement through his electric wheelchair, and uses a breathing machine to sleep, who will be exited on Saturday. I have five clients living with severe schizophrenia who are going to be left to fend for themselves, who are doing well and have made significant progress in the hotels. I have four clients on oxygen who will not be able to breathe. I'm going to say that again. They will not be able to breathe if we truly leave them outside with no electricity. Last week, I, have paid, I personally paid the entirety of my own income to keep a child in a wheelchair sheltered who needs electricity to survive. If I do that again this week, I will not be able to pay my own bills. Some may ask why I did this. To me, knowing that a child will not survive and doing nothing is no different than killing them. I will not be any part of this child dying. Certainly not because of a policy choice. In all of these cases, I have asked for help and received little or none. Vermont is failing to protect our most vulnerable. At End Homelessness Vermont, we work primarily with people with complex needs and disabilities, as well as working with people at the point of an emergency. That means that we are being extraordinarily overwhelmed with calls, and at all times this week, we have been 114 or more calls behind. Our most vulnerable clients are being left to catastrophic outcomes. Nearly 2,000 Vermonters, including hundreds of children, as we've heard today, will lose their access to shelter by mid-October. This burden will be left on providers, municipalities, and our communities in general. We must all agree that our most vulnerable Vermonters, which were already determined in Act 113, people experiencing homelessness, deserve continuous shelter. Letting people suffer the most catastrophic outcomes is not who I believe we are in Vermont. The Vermont we know brings people together. In floods, we pick up shovel and support our fellow Vermonters. These are our fellow Vermonters. Our municipalities need support to address this crisis in a humane way. We cannot criminalize people for a housing crisis and an unsheltering that they did not create. Municipalities need to hear that. This unsheltering, this unhousing, and this housing crisis was not created by the people you see on the street. Our community members need to meet those who are suffering with empathy and understanding, or this crisis will never get better. We are long past the time for blame. I live in a Vermont where we all come together. How we got here is a conversation we must have to prevent it from ever happening again. However, right now, in this moment, right this second, we are in a crisis of our own making, and we must set aside politics, disagreements that we may have with one another, and work together to ensure the survival, health, and well-being of our community members, neighbors, and fellow Vermonters. In this moment, because we are not in a legislative session, there is only one person with the power to protect Vermont's most vulnerable, and that is Governor Scott. I think every single provider 
across the state is willing to work together to come up with a trauma-informed, adequate, and responsible solution to the crisis that is happening right now. We are your partners, Governor Scott. Please work with us to resolve this and ensure that Vermonters do not lose their lives, because some definitely will. The governor must call a special session and work with the legislature and providers to correct course of this inhumane action. We cannot allow this to stand. We cannot allow this to stand. We are better than this, and we must do better than this and be better than this. Um, we also have Shelby LeBaron, who's going to come, but her muffler fell off on the way here. So we're just waiting for, for her to come up. We're gonna go with Frank now. I thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Frank Kinnack. I'm the Executive Director of the Housing and Homelessness Alliance of Vermont. I think you heard from folks who are working on this uh, crisis on the ground about the human harms that are happening every day in our communities. I'm just up here to provide some additional context of what it's looking like in Vermont right now. Um, and so, as you know, uh, according to the latest housing report, uh, state of Vermont has approximately 541 shelter beds. The over 1,000, uh, 1,059 households who are being exited from the GA program by uh, the 10th of next month are in addition to those 541 household um, shelter bed capacity. And so what that shows you right off the bat is we have no capacity, our shelter providers have no capacity to handle this crisis. They're already overstretched um, in many ways, as Julie mentioned earlier. I also want to clarify one thing as well. You know, uh, this, this issue has been up for many, many years now um, and has gone through various iterations. The, the situation we have now with the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program in the eligibility criteria is very clear. It is limited to the folks who the state of Vermont has identified as the most vulnerable Vermonters. And so when I mentioned the 1,059 households being exited, those are 1,059 100% vulnerable Vermont commu uh, community members. They are seniors. They are families with children. They are people with disabilities. They are people fleeing domestic violence. Um, and thought that the state of Vermont is just going to let this happen is just unconscionable. Uh, finally, I want to note uh, that uh, uh, a group of over 80 service providers from across the state of Vermont came together, united this morning in a letter to the governor calling for the governor to do one of three things. As Brenda mentioned, only the governor right now has the, really the power to act to solve this crisis. Uh, the, in, in that letter, they clearly called on the governor to either call a state of emergency and to utilize his authorities under, that, under those authorities. Uh, to call for a special session so that the general uh, that the legislature can come back and remove the 80 day cap and remove the 111 room cap that we currently are in, um, and, or to direct the agency of human services uh, to identify additional resources that it may have um, to ensure that everyone who has been, recently been unhoused uh, through these changes to the GA program has access to trauma informed, non congregate, safe, accessible shelter. Um, as we get closer to December 1st. Um, so I think at this point, we're happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Just to clarify your demands here, so you mentioned those, those three courses of action, but ultimately, what are I think the most logical um, and the best for the Im Im impact individuals would be to remove the caps and try and get folks back into the hotels and motels that provide safe, stable, secure shelter for individuals. Um, I think one thing we saw with what happened after BAA last year with the congregate um, was um, a, a crisis in a different form. You know, you had, uh, for example, the, the setup here in Montpelier was not near any public transportation. Uh, it was not open 24 hours a day. Uh, people couldn't leave their stuff. I mean, there's just basic things that people need to survive that, that that system did not provide. And so the solution needs to ensure that people have safe, stable, non-congregate shelter um, that's trauma-informed. And uh, the, GA, the hotel motel program is, is the best we can do right now. 
helping out with that. So I'm not sure if others have comments on that. I will just add, as um, a mayor on the front lines, we have already um, earlier this summer started, because I said before, camping is not a policy. We started assessing the entire city to see what available empty spaces existed for us to actually create emergency, more emergency shelter beds in Burlington. And after an exhaustive search and multiple sites, we were only able to come up with one building, which is the federal building on Pearl Street, and we're in a um, cooperative arrangement with Cox, a local um, provider, to try to stand something up by the winter, but we could not find anything. So the reality, and just to affirm what Frank was saying, the reality is the best approach right now, especially for families and especially for folks with medical conditions, is to have access to space that is safe and appropriate for them. And going back into the motel program is the only solution at this point, because I'll say from the ground, we were unable to find, and we are very, Willing city to do this, but we were unable to find additional spaces and the cost, et cetera, on any municipality is nearly impossible, even if you were able to find 20, a space for 20 beds here, et cetera. That would just be congregate care, which again is not best practice for most of the population, that, or if not the whole population has been exited recently. Mayor, a question for you. As you know, last year there was, I think we were part of a group of 17 lawmakers that were going to sustain the governor's veto on the budget. Of course, he didn't veto the budget this year, but, but why didn't we see anything like that crystallize this year in the session? Well, I wasn't in the legislature for that last half of the session. I went on to other things, other very challenging things. Um, but uh, but what I will say is, I think you know, I think there is a, a little bit of a, an exhaustion level. I think there's a little bit of a, um, I see it in Burlington every day. For some folks, they're at a compassion fatigue level. Um, however, it is imperative that elected leaders not give up. That is not a, an acceptable answer of saying this is going to be our new normal. And so I was disappointed to, to see even some of my fellow colleagues, as you said about a year and a half ago, who stood together with me to form a multi-party co coalition to say this is not acceptable, um, not come together this particular session to sound the alarm yet, yet again. Um, and this is an opportunity for people to step forward. But the governor is the one right now, just to be super clear, the governor is the one, as a fellow executive now, the governor has the power to take action immediately. This is, if this is at his um, feet in order to take action and reverse course and to avoid significant harm to these Vermonters. Are, are, is anybody here aware of any other, or any state legislators that are also calling for a state of emergency, state of emergency or a special session? I have seen from uh, some state legislators that they are calling for there to be a solution and the governor is the one who has to call that solution. I mean, it really, we really aren't in a legislative session right now, so it is on the governor to address this crisis. I wanna just add to the previous question as someone on the ground, that there are lots of clients that we have and people that we speak to every single day, and I'm sure Julie can also attest to this, who it's not a congregate shelter setting, especially not one without bathrooms or showers, which some of the ones we saw in March had, those weren't real shelters. Those were, I, call, I sometimes call that the abandoned building project. We, they, they didn't actually have real solutions in it with or transportation to them. The Burlington one was the only one that had providers who were able to be there all the time in the morning and at night. It was it just wasn't available really real service or oriented or a real shelter. But I will say that even in those settings, the people with the most complex needs, this is not an appropriate setting for them. And families with children, this is not an appropriate setting for them. We already know, because the data shows, that non-congregate shelter is the most appropriate for moving people from homelessness into permanent housing, and that homelessness is a housing problem. But we also know that people with complex needs who are in wheelchairs or need electricity to survive or people with severe psychiatric disabilities, that that setting is not necessarily appropriate. And I thought maybe Julie could speak to that a little bit because they run a semi-congregate shelter or a congregate, I don't know what you call it. Do you want to? <laughs> well, well the, with the one that has, you know, in some of your shelters there's two people in the room and that even just with two people, that's not appropriate for all people with complex needs. Yes, I suppose right now in trying to understand the, the needs of those who, if we had room, we could take in the shelters, um, even sharing space with one individual, so double occupancy at some of our, our shelters uh, is an impossibility for them. Um, that might be because of, you know, just uh, some kind of, you know, uh, mental health 
experience that they're having a disability, uh, but it, it's very real, and it's it's one of the reasons why uh, folks have found their space in the in the motels over the last four years is because it's the only option. Because oftentimes we don't have the luxury in our shelters, in particular, to house people in single rooms. Uh, we have three single rooms in our entire 82 bed system. So that's just not, it's not possible. We would love it to be, but it's not yet possible. This could be for anybody. Last week, town and city managers were kind of asking for some of the same things, saying the service providers were just out and burnt out and everybody needs help. But then later that day at Governor Scott's press conference, mm -hmm. I mean, he's pretty adamant for years now this program needs to be wound down. What I've heard the autism special session not great from him. So like, what do you guys realistically expect to see from a governor who has repeatedly said this is going to get wound out in some form or fashion? I, I just want to say that we can't wind down this program on the backs of the most vulnerable people. We can't wind down this program at the cost of human lives, which is what's going to happen. We cannot wind down this program at the cost of the future of the children who are, we are putting on the street. This is a humanitarian crisis. So while we all agree that we need a off-ramp that actually keeps people sheltered and gives them access to permanent housing without ending up on the street, we all agree with that. But we, I don't think anyone standing here can agree, and not a single provider or municipality that I've spoken to can agree, that the, res, that the we can wind down this program at the cost of the human beings in our state. Because I think it's important to understand that that's exactly what we are doing. So to your question, I, I, and Homelessness Vermont does not accept that as the response. Because it is the responsibility of the leader of this state to address a crisis when it comes forward. And this is a crisis, and he must address it. He may not like the solutions we have, and lots of people during the flooding didn't like the solutions we had. But the hotel motel program, according to every provider across the state, 80 people who signed on to a letter, it, and municipalities, is right now the solution we have. And we will all be partners, we are all Governor Scott's and this administration and this legislature's partners in finding a better solution when they are able and willing to work with us to do that. Thanks. Yes. It might be helpful to think of it in parallel solutions so that if we maintain the motel system for the moment and can, can address shelter, uh, additional shelter bed capacity, some of that has been created or there's been proposals funded to start hopefully in December or thereabouts in the winter. But the speed at which we can put up new shelters is not quick. It's a very complex, very complex process. And uh, I know our organization put forth nine and a half million dollars of request this summer to provide solutions, but they're not immediate. They take time. It's just the same as, as uh, affordable housing. Um, so that's why trying to keep folks sheltered at the same time that we are in development of shelter beds or affordable housing is really an important consideration for, for our whole state. Thanks. Can I just add one, one piece? Oh, um, one piece of that quick question and hand it over to Shelby. Um, I think it's also important to, to note what we're trying to do here, which is to educate the governor about what's actually happening on the ground. If you look back to what ha where we started at the beginning of last legislative session and what the governor's budget looked like, um, it had severe restrictions of this program. And through education of lawmakers, through education of the governor, we saw progress happening during the last legislative session. So what we're doing today is having the folks who are on the ground having to deal with this crisis firsthand coming together to tell the governor that what he is, uh, is, um, is trying to push is a policy that's not only destructive to human lives, but also a massive waste of tax dollars. And so whether he cares about this from a human perspective or from a taxpayer's perspective, he should look at these recommendations seriously and he should follow these recommendations.
Uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I'm Shelby LeBaron. I exited the motel program recently. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm Shelby LeBaron. I exited the motel program recently, thankfully, before this 80-day cap and room cap started. Last year, I was miscategorized and was scheduled to be exited while I was in labor. I am now working with End Homelessness Vermont, and I know I talk to people every single day who are just like my family was and are in even more dangerous situations. I know that the, those people are going to have to try to live outside, and some of them won't. I want to talk a little bit about what I saw on Thursday, September 19th. I know that we will continue to see things like this throughout the end of the month and the month of September. On Thursday, we did not see a lot of new families get sheltered. We also know that even though the department is saying the 80 days allowed more people to have access to shelter, we saw the state limit rooms in July. We also know that people who called back every day did get back. I saw End Homelessness Vermont in four counties handing out tents beyond our existing resources. In one county, we were the only organization on the ground watching as families and people with extreme disabilities and health conditions were exited. I had conversations on Thursday and since just trying to comfort clients who did not and do not understand what was happening or what is going to happen due to their disability. People who have such severe medical conditions that they are terrified because they know that they cannot survive outside. They are worried about crowding emergency rooms. They don't want to be a burden on emergency rooms but they also do not want to die. What do you say? What do you say when someone is begging for their life and safety? And nobody that could do something about it will even listen. I am broken down by our system in a whole new way. I listened to and cried with too many people and there will be too many more. I had people from my outside life asking me if I saw the one, one news article about what was happening on Thursday, which barely even went into the reality of the sheer numbers of people living with disabilities and children who will be on the streets. On Thursday, I could not lay my head down or go to bed knowing that there are now children that are crying in a tent in their parents' arms, knowing that there are people struggling to breathe right now, knowing that there are people having anxiety attacks that feel like heart attacks because they are completely alone. All the hard work that they have done, and they have done it, it's gone. There are people in wheelchairs that have no one and can't even set up a tent on their own or get to a bathroom. In the two days of the 19th and 20th, I physically lost my voice completely after so many tears so much crying and so much anger at the amount of people turning the other way instead of doing something about this. About the amount of people willing to let families like mine and people who are extremely vulnerable potentially die. To the governor, I ask you to call a special, a special session 
and take immediate action to protect Vermonters who have been exited from the program. I am no better than them because I got out of this. I am luckier. I ask municipalities to discontinue efforts to criminalize the victims of this crisis. I ask our communities and fellow Vermonters to be kind to each other and compassionate. This can happen to anyone. The people outside did not do this to themselves. It was done to them. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, we talked about, I mean, this is happening in ways because of the 80-day you know, cap expiring over time. We got a sense of the impact last Thursday when this started to happen. How much more of this going to happen? How many more people, families? Are going to be um, so according to the state's own data in their uh, August housing report, um, you're looking at roughly 75% who are in the program on July 1 who will be exited by 10-8. So we're looking at, I think it's 1,059 households. And again, that's households, not individuals. The state uses 1.6 um, as its um, uh, multiplier. So you're looking at you know, 1,600 plus people um, who will be exited. Uh, by and 1,600 of the most vulnerable people will be exited by the 8th of next month. And the largest single day number um, was the 19th, um, but there uh, other big days for exits are going to be this Saturday, the 28th. Um, we, we support people through ac accessing vouchers, and so we look at the actual dates on our end at End Homelessness Vermont, which is just a unique role that we play. Um, and so the 28th, we see a lot of exits, and that is because it's people um, on SSI and SSDI with the most uh, common amounts that they receive because your self-pay days, I will not get into the weeds, but your self-pay days don't count towards your 80 days. So that pushed them to the 28th. And then uh, the other date that we're seeing a large number of exits is October 7th. Um, and so that is the other time that we are seeing a large number. But between the 19th and the 11th is what we've seen mostly, right? Between the 19th of September and the 11th of October, there is a pretty steady stream of people being exited. We are getting calls for tents and trying to figure out how to get people them. So the other thing that this did was make it so providers really couldn't plan for how to get, make sure everybody had a tent and sleeping bag when they walked out the door because it's happening in all this, it's happening in chaos. So. Just add one piece to that. Um, the state report that mentioned uh, the 1,059 households did not include the folks who were exited on the 15th because of the 1,100 room cap. And so we went from, I think, around 1,300-ish rooms down to 11. So you have a few more hundred that were exited that day um, that were incorporated into that number. And Calvin, I just want to answer your question really quickly um, about why didn't we see more of a, um, it takes a whole lot of energy that you all have seen sometimes um, coming from me and others um, to get the press to pay attention to this issue uh, because you feel like the story has been told. And I would say that um, this humanitarian crisis was, it's, it's really on all of us. And I mean all of us. I mean providers, community members, municipalities, the legislature, the governor, and the press that this was allowed to happen because if we don't take responsibility and think it matters that people in poverty are going to suffer. That is part of how we, as a culture, have built systemic discrimination into our cult uh, systemic discrimination against people in poverty into our culture. And so, if it was any other marginalized group, there would be story after story after story after story after story about this issue, and 
I think it's time for everyone to consider people in poverty and people in extreme poverty and people living and experiencing homelessness as a historically discriminated against group. Because I certainly know as someone who lived in poverty for the last 20 years, this is my first year out of poverty, that uh, that's, those systems are not built to get you out of poverty. They aren't built to get you out of poverty. And I only didn't end up in homelessness because I had a family member I could stay with at the three different times I lost my housing in my life. It wasn't necessarily good situations, but it was, and people experiencing homelessness will do whatever it takes to be inside. And, uh, and so we didn't experience it for that reason. And Shelby didn't get out of homelessness, like she said, because she's better than the people who are still in it, or because she worked harder. It's because she was one of the lucky people who found a solution, if that's what we can call it. And so I think that it's really important to understand that when people come to you and say, there's going to be a humanitarian crisis. Yes, I know you've told this story before, but it matters that people are going to die, that Vermonters are going to die, that we tell this story just like we would any other historically marginalized group who's also discriminated against regularly. Because that's how we got here. That's the answer to how we got here. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it, um, telling this important story. And happy to stick around if anyone has any other questions. Thanks.